I'd like to tell you about um, the hope and promise of stem cells and particularly talk about how uh, embryonic development can be uh, used to find uh, new therapeutics. So this is a human embryo at 28 days and that embryo has all of its organs. And if we could capture the knowledge of how the embryo actually makes its organs, we could develop a whole slew of new therapeutics. The problem with human embryos, obviously, is there's ethical challenges of using embryos. There's also problems uh, of getting enough embryos, and it takes a long time for them to actually develop. And so uh, several years ago, I had the idea that we needed another type of embryo to study. And the embryo that I decided to work on was the zebrafish. So zebrafish is an amazing model organism. Uh, you can actually buy them in the pet store. They're $1.50. Um, and I currently have 300,000 fish at Children's Hospital. And that's almost at the level that you could do population genetics. Um, but um, the other thing is that every mother has about 200 babies a week. So you can think childcare for zebrafish is pretty expensive. <laughs> But um, these embryos are also uh, transparent, and you can watch them develop under a microscope. And I just want to show you one of those embryos developing at the four cell and the eight cell and the 16 cell stage, and it's sitting on top of a yolk. And the yolk is the nutrient supply for this uh, fish embryo. And now what you're going to see is the future brain is actually going to develop. And you'll see this at the top where you can see the eye will actually uh, form as an organ. And you'll see this very shortly. And you can see on the right side, the muscles are starting to form. And then the tail is actually lifting off the, the body of the fish embryo. So that animal is 19 hours old. And that has all of its organs. So if you were to look at a 19-hour-old zebrafish embryo and a 28-day-old human embryo, they look very, very similar to each other. And so we had hoped when we started this work that we could capture the information from the zebrafish embryo and translate it, that into therapies uh, for humans. And in fact, one of the first things we did was to find mutant fish that couldn't form particular organs, let's say couldn't form blood. And we had families of fish that had a genetic disease that couldn't form blood, and then we discovered the cause of that disease, and then we transferred that information to humans and in the process, we found that humans who were anemic, who had less blood, actually were mutated in the same versions of the genes that we found in the fish. So we had discovered actually four new human diseases by studying the fish first. I'm a hematologist, and I take care of children who have blood diseases or cancer. And one of the things that I've actually done is what's called a bone marrow transplant. So the principle of a bone marrow transplant is that um, um, if you have leukemia, I can treat the leukemia with high-dose chemotherapy and erase the leukemia. But unfortunately, your immune cells are also rapidly dividing, and they're affected by the chemotherapy, so the immune cells go away also. So you need another cell, another stem cell, to be replaced the so the immune system could actually be replaced. And so um, what we've done is um, taken a brother or sister's bone marrow, um, which would be a match, and we could give that to the patient. And actually, doing a bone marrow transplant is kind of an anticlimactic thing for a physician, is you uh, show up at the bedside, and I have a bag of blood. And it looks, actually, it's a bag of marrow. It looks the same. It has red color to it. And then I just start an IV. And then the cells get put into the veins, and the stem cells know where to go. This is a process which is called homing. And it happens probably within about 48 hours. And those stem cells will eventually get into the marrow, which is where your blood is made, and then uh, they engraft. Now, I'm always asked, like, what is engraftment as a process? And the way I think about this is, remember when you were in college and you had a final exam, right? And then after the final exam, you went home. And what did you do for the first three days when you were home? Yeah, you sleep, right? And so you sleep for three days. And then on day four, you wake up and you're in your own bed, right? And, that, and you're home. 
And so that's what engraftment is, OK? <laughs> and then, then this, a single blood stem cell has the ability to make all six pints of blood that you have flowing through your arteries and veins. So there's a tremendous self-renewal uh, of this uh, system. And you only need to have this process done once. It's curative for any type of cancer or, or blood disease. So I've been very fascinated with what affects the stem cells to allow themselves to renew themselves. In other words, what is self-renewal? And I just want to tell you um, a little bit of my own research. I decided uh, before giving this lecture to Google um, self-renewal. And I want to present my results. So here's my results. <laughs> I found selfrenewal.com, and I want to report to you my famous results here that what self-renewal is on the top left, it's dating cars and entertainment. Okay. <laughs> so um, I could stop my lecture, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about uh, stem cells. So now when we look in a zebrafish, and that's what the top uh, part of this slide is, you would see a line of cells. And that line of cells is actually the birth of blood stem cells. So all of your adult blood was actually born when you were an embryo. And uh, it's those stem cells that have this amazing ability to renew themselves that goes forth. And um, on the bottom, you can see that um, the stem cells are born in the aorta of the human and of the fish. So basically, 300 million years of evolution, where you make your adult blood stem cells is in an embryo, and it's in this uh, large blood vessel, the aorta. So I want to tell you um, how this cell finds its way to different stem cell niches. So this is a fish embryo at about 36 hours of development. And you'll see the heart there, and you'll see this aorta. And now we're going to dive into the aorta. So now when you're in the aorta, there's a, an, a blood vessel cell that changes its fate to become a blood stem cell. This is the birth of the first blood stem cell. It rounds up, and it goes from the artery into the vein. And then once it's in the vein, it's going to go off into circulation now and start to colonize the next site where blood cells are formed. That happens in the fish to be in its tail. So you'll see this stem cell will actually come in and attaches to the blood vessel wall. And then what happens is it will transmigrate through the endothelial wall, through that vessel wall, start dividing. And then some of the stem cells will enter back into circulation. And then it lands in another site of blood development, which is in the kidney of the zebrafish. That's the adult site where blood cells are formed. And that's the equivalent of the marrow. And some of the cells actually bypass the kidney region and go to the thymus. And that's where the beginning of the immune system would start. And so this lets this uh, fish um, have its blood throughout its entire lifetime. And so what's interesting about this is the, the places where the stem cells travel, it's very similar to when I do a bone marrow transplant on a patient. I put it into the veins, and those stem cells travel all over, and they land in a particular place. So I wanted to understand was there any um, way we could discover what the signals are that would create more stem cells? Because stem cells are limiting for me in the clinic when I do a transplant. And so one of the things that I did was to take chemicals, different chemicals, and added them to fish embryos. And then I looked for a chemical that could actually increase blood stem cells. And out of about 3,000 chemicals that we screened, we found one chemical that tremendously upregulated the stem cells. And so that was very exciting. And then within three years, we were able to take that chemical and give it to patients. And this chemical is called prostaglandin E2. It's a natural lipid that's in your body. And we found that it tremendously increases blood stem cells. So we did a clinical trial. And so this trial was for 12 patients who have leukemia. And um, they don't have a marrow from a brother or sister that's a match. And so when that happens, we go on to look for other sources of stem cells. And one of those sources would be umbilical cord stem cells. They have a lot of good blood stem cells. I should say stem cells are very good in the cord blood, but they don't have many of them there. And so what we do in the clinic is the standard of care is to give two babies worth of stem cells, two cord bloods worth of stem cells, to a patient who has leukemia if they're an adult. And so in this experiment, we treated one of the cord blood samples with the drug that we discovered and left the other one untreated. 
and we put them both into the patient. And the clinical trial actually happened in the patient because our hypothesis was that the treated cord blood would work better. And what we saw was in 10 out of 12 patients, the treated cord was the one that actually engrafted. And the white blood cells and the platelets from that, those cords came back about four and a half days earlier than what we saw in historical controls. So this is 12 patients, um, but it's very exciting data, and we're now in the process of doing a phase two trial with 50 patients, and we're about to do a pediatric trial, actually, to, uh, to see if it will work on, on children also. So it's been very satisfying as a physician scientist to have something go from the laboratory uh, to the clinic. Sometimes we call this from the bench to the bedside. Um, what we call this is from the tank to the bedside. <laughs> so as we were doing our work, um, we decided we wanted to attempt to do a bone marrow transplant in a fish. And so we had a fish that had green marrow, and we took that marrow and injected it into a fish that's been irradiated so it doesn't have an immune system. And what we saw, which was quite amazing, is all of the blood was actually green. And so um, what you saw is uh, the, all the blood is, uh, in the vasculature is green. When, um, what I showed you there was actually a picture of uh, the fin of the zebrafish. And that's a thin area, so you can look at the microscope and see uh, those blood cells migrate. But I wanted to see the stem cell go into the marrow, which is in the kidney. But I had a problem. Um, the stripes of the zebrafish were getting in the way. So we tried to focus between the stripes, and we could never get the microscope to focus. Um, but luckily, one of my postdoctoral fellows decided to try to create something that would help. And what he created was um, a mutant fish that was completely transparent, which we call Casper the transparent fish. <laughs> so Casper is an amazing fish. You can see the eggs in the middle of this fish. You can see the heart. You can see the aorta. You can see the bones. Um, you can read the newspaper through this fish. <laughs> and it's an amazing system for transplantation, as I'll tell you. Um, when we published this work, um, it was picked up by the popular press. We were in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe as discovering a transparent fish. Um, but I happened to get an email from a friend of mine, and the title of the email is, You Are Famous. And so the question is, what, what happened? And so it turned out that Jay Leno decided to do a joke about our Casper fish. So I want to play that for you. Researchers at Children's Hospital in Boston have genetically engineered transparent fish, see-through fish. The fish are totally transparent. No, not amazing? Hmm? Hmm? And you know Red Lobster is going to jump all over this for their, for their seafood platter. We didn't forget your fish, sir. It's just invisible. They're right there. Just look carefully, sir. You'll see. It's a long way to go. <laughs> it does tell you that you can become famous uh, working on uh, embryos and fish, particularly. <laughs> so with this model, we've begun to do transplantation of a variety of different organs, and it's just been amazing. So um, we have done marrow transplants, and what I've shown here is a fish that received either green marrow cells or red marrow cells, and they've been grafted, and we've added chemicals to those cells, and we've found new chemicals that can actually increase the engraftment process, and we hope they'll also help uh, prostaglandin do its job and help patients. Um, we've also been able to put in tumor cells into Casper, and we can watch single cells spread from the tumor and metastasize, and so it's quite an amazing discovery tool, and so we're, we're very, very excited about this. Now, I'm the director of the stem cell program at Children's Hospital of Boston. One of the things that we've been working on is personalized stem cells. So I can take a skin biopsy from any of you and um, actually add some factors to it that reprogram the cell to make it think it's an embryo. And this cell can make all the tissues of your body. And we can put this cell into culture, and it grows forever. And so let's say we take the cell from a patient who has no immune system, the bubble boy syndrome, and we can culture those cells in a dish, and then we developed a way, shown here, uh, to correct the genetic disease, to surgically go in and correct the mutation that causes the disease. And then on the right side of the bottom of this slide, you would see that we have corrected cells. We could turn those cells into blood stem cells and then transplant them into the patient. This would be curative. 
We've done this in a mouse, and now we're in the process of trying to do this in a human. And this would really transform regenerative medicine. We're also trying to grow other tissues, uh, muscle and liver and heart and neurons and the islet cells that produce insulin in your pancreas. Because any diseased organ could have tissue transplanted. And remember, the cells that would be transplanted come from the patients themselves. So they won't be rejected at all. They have the same DNA that the patient has. So one of the problems that we've had is how do you turn these cells into the variety of different tissues? And so I've been interested for a long time in muscle development. And so we wondered if we could find out the cues to turn the cells into muscle. And so what we did is we took zebrafish and we cultured the cells from a zebrafish embryo. And we put them in little wells and added a chemical to the well to see if we could find a chemical that would turn them into muscle. And sure enough, we found several chemicals, just a handful of chemicals, that would turn them into muscle. And this was very exciting because we could then take human stem cells and put three of our chemicals with the human stem cells, and they turn the cells into muscle in a dish. So we could take a skin cell and turn it into muscle in a dish. But we went ahead and actually took those cells and transplanted them into a mouse that doesn't have an immune system. And what you see on the right there is the mouse is making human muscle. So it's very exciting to be able to think about this. Um, there's a number of diseases that we see here at Children's Hospital which would be helped by this. And certainly muscular dystrophy would be at the head of these. So we're hoping to develop a new therapy um, by growing these stem cells into muscle. Now I want to close with our work on zebrafish cancer. And this is really amazing. Zebrafish can get cancer. And we've developed models for a variety of different tumors. Shown here is a, a devastating tumor called melanoma. This is a skin tumor. And it's very frequent. Uh, and the incidence is going way up over time. And um, we've also made leukemia models. We've made pancreatic cancer models. We've made muscle tumor models. And so you can model any of these diseases. One of the things that's very nice about the zebrafish system is a lot of people think that cancer has somewhat turned back the clock to an embryonic state. So it might be that when somebody develops cancer, it's behaving like an embryo usually behaves. The tissues start to invade, and there's that kind of character to it. So in the zebrafish, we can use the embryos, and we can also relate them to the adult tissues that are getting cancer. We also know that you can have a lot of fish and so when we do a drug trial in the zebrafish, every time we have a particular arm of a trial, there's 100 fish in that trial. And then lastly, shown on the bottom, we can actually transplant tumor cells into Casper and watch the cells spread. We've shown here a melanoma that was put in there. And we've not only put in fish tumors into Casper, but we've taken human tumors and put them into Casper and watched them spread. And we're trying to discover uh, ways of treating cancer that haven't been found before. So one of the things that we did was to realize that stem cells relate to cancer. So it turns out that the cancers um, may be, be back up and looking like a stem cell. So we took uh, embryos that have melanocyte stem cells, and we um, added chemicals. And we found a drug, which is an arthritis drug, that completely uh, eliminates these stem cells. And then what we did is take human tumors and transplant them into nude mice and give this chemical, which is an arthritis drug that, every, that people with rheumatoid arthritis take. So it's, uh, it's known not to be so toxic. And this actually uh, gets rid of the tumor. And in combination with another drug that people are known to take for melanoma, um, actually about 40% of the mice had no melanoma at all. So this has led to a clinical trial um, where we're giving this drug leflunamide plus another drug that uh, is commonly taken. And the end point is actually to look for an increase in survival. And we'd like to be able to see um, over, uh, survival from seven months to 10 and a half months, which would be success for this very devastating tumor. So I hope I've convinced you that by studying embryos, uh, we're learning amazing things. And transferring that knowledge and developing new therapeutics, it's going to be uh, quite a new age. And so I'm very excited about it. And I just want to say that our goal is to have these models and to ultimately um, develop ways of culturing the cells, um, being able to develop cellular therapies with different organs, and then ultimately putting them into patients at the top of this. And then I'd like to tell you about the people who've done the work. And this is my laboratory. And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it.